I am Nicole Perleroth, cybersecurity reporter at the failing New York Times. And I have the honor of being here today with Alex Stamos, uh, who is now at Stanford after um, being chief information security officer at Facebook, and Rachel Wilson, who's a managing director at Morgan Stanley and just two years ago was at the NSA. So um, there's going to be a lot to unpack today and the title of our session is pretty broad. Um, but I should probably stop here and just say, you know, we're, we're, this is actually the Friday following the biggest security conference of the year, RSA, which has been taking place in San Francisco all week. And this year was the biggest RSA of them all. I mean, there were thousands more companies there this year than I've seen before, which is saying a lot. Um, promising to secure you and your companies from everything under the sun, except, of course, in certain cases where a determined nation-state enemy wants access to your travel itineraries, your customers' hotel reservations, your intellectual property, emails, your pipelines, factory floors, uranium centrifuges, customers' news feeds. Um, you know, these, as the Chinese proverb goes, are very, very interesting times in the world of cybersecurity and privacy. And in the vast majority of cases, at least, it's really the American companies and, our, and, and corporations all over the world, I should say, um, you know, banks, defense companies, energy, um, more recently social media platforms and hospitality, we just saw this huge breach at Marriott, um, that are on the front lines of this battle. And you know, those who've tried to understand sort of the current state of the world sometimes try to compare uh, cyber warfare to nuclear warfare. And um, Many suggest, you know, the only way to understand why we're not in sort of this all-out cyber war with our enemies has something to do with some sort of imagined detente that we're in. And um, they try to look at cyber deterrence through the prism of nuclear deterrence theory. But that prism really does not apply very well to the cyber realm. You know, for one, cyber weapons aren't nuclear weapons. You know, even if I sit here and tell you all the secrets to developing a nuclear weapon, you still have to produce the fissile material for them to work. And cyber weapons don't require fissile material. They just require vulnerabilities and some code, a way to get into a system, and a way to weaponize those vulnerabilities or uh, for espionage or for destruction. And unlike nu nuclear deterrence theory and cyber, the barrier to entry is so much lower. So anyone with $2,000 for a laptop is basically in this game, and it's only getting easier. Um, there's also just the potential for escalation is so much swifter. So unlike nuclear deterrence, our own stockpile of cyber weapons has hardly kept our adversaries from trying to acquire their own. And Basically, um, hundreds of companies are now stockpiling vulnerabilities and exploits to develop cyber weapons for espionage or the event they might have to drop a cyber weapon on a rainy day. Um, and, you know, Russia, North Korea, Iran, if you're following our recent reporting, have demonstrated that actually now they really see cyber as one of the only ways to level the playing field. And frankly, why shouldn't they? I mean, you could argue that though the United States is the most sophisticated nation state adversary when it comes to offensive cyber warfare, we are woefully behind on defense. And in many ways, you could say we're actually one of the most vulnerable, um, particularly as we move our transportation systems, our energy systems, and all of our critical infrastructure systems online. Uh, the consequences of breaches, potential to do us serious harm have only increased. And I haven't even mentioned the latest threat to United, United States, which is disinformation, um, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit with Alex about. Um, but what's interesting is nation states are continually learning from each other in the realm of cyber warfare. So the Sony attack was only five years ago. And in, in that attack, if you'll remember, North Koreans didn't just destroy Sony servers, they leaked executives' emails and created a playbook for the 2016 DNC election hack. Um, and basically we've seen so many, so many breaches where Iranians have teased apart code that was used 
to infect their own uranium centrifuges um, and use that on their own enemies in the Persian Gulf um, and increasingly abroad. So in cyber, the enemy is a very good teacher. Um, you know, every computer virus, every um, malware payload backdoor, even the most sophisticated cyber weapon on earth, once it's discovered, can be teased apart, reverse engineered bit by bit down to its most fundamental parts. And then with enough time and skill can be retrofitted and used back on the enemy. And the stakes for all of this are only getting higher, especially with the internet of things upon us. You know, very soon, if your car doesn't already, if it doesn't already, it'll, it'll talk to the internet. So will your refrigerator and your stove and your baby monitor and your pacemaker and your insulin pump <laughs> and your body. And you know, perhaps um, we have not yet seen a case of a nation state searching or buying ways to hack into these systems yet, at least in public, but you can imagine what sort of the future of cyber warfare will look like very soon. So I always like to remember that it was only 40 years ago that humans dispatched the first message over the internet just down the road here in Portola Valley. And then you have to imagine, okay, if that was only 40 some years ago, what will this look like in another 10 years, in another 20 years? Think how much more dependent our economy will be, have become on the web, and how much more of our critical infrastructure will have gone online. And then you start to think about the potential for real destruction. And it seems like until now, only when we've had these very public, visible mishaps have rules been created. And we're sort of right in the middle of this regime. Um, I might ask Alex today about Zuckerberg's privacy manifesto uh, the other day. But you know, we have, we have the added challenge of developing rules for a world that's not just international, but transnational. We're, um, with nation states and private actors, each with enormous power, um, and the lines between which tools apply to offense and which tools apply to defense are not so clear. And finally, with the global supply chain, we can't even ensure that the most fundamental parts of our technology infrastructure, the microchips, the encryption chips, the ones and zeros, were not altered in some way uh, to ensure foreign intelligence services can maintain access to our infrastructure. So this is a lot, and um, it seems like when you're covering cybersecurity at the New York Times, I always say we should really have 15 people covering cybersecurity at the New York Times. You could have someone covering Chinese espionage all day. You could have someone covering Iran, what the U.S. is doing in terms of its own offensive cyber warfare capabilities, and then disinformation right now needs like 10 reporters going into the 2020 election. Um, so, and, and really it's the private sector that's, that's left to grapple with some of the most complicated issues of our day. And so we're really fortunate to have Alex and Rachel here today to tease this apart far better than I can. So with that, I'd like to um, again introduce Alex, who many of you probably know by name already, but, um, is uh, I've been in close contact. Alex actually has been involved with probably 80% of some of the biggest breaches over the last 10 years, whether he was overseeing security <laughs> at that company or consulting with companies that have been uh, the victim of a breach. So he, when you talk about how CISOs are really on the front lines of these battles, he's probably been um, on the front lines more than anyone else. So with that, I'll let Alex take it away. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. Um, as Nicole has pointed out, a number of my friends call me the Forrest Gump of information security, um, always in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, yeah, na my name's Alex. I'm currently an adjunct professor here at Stanford, uh, which is a, a nice change of pace uh, because it turns out there's no emergencies in academia. Um, but before that, I have had a pretty long history uh, in kind of uh, coming from a traditional cybersecurity background as a kind of teenage hacker who had the ability to, to uh, get to go to a good school and to get uh, a better school than this one um, and, and get a, a good uh, economic opportunity, an opportunity that's not available to most people that grow up in those kinds of conditions, uh, and then to have a, a long career 
uh, professionally in the traditional cyber world, um, which has also then, you know, my adjunct, I'm an adjunct professor in the School of International Relations, um, which is hilarious because I've never actually taken a course in international relations uh, at any collegiate level. Um, but it's because to to be in our job, to be a chief security officer, means that you are now enmeshed in nation-to-nation -nation conflict. Um, and that's why I want to talk really briefly uh, and try to tee up the panel a bit, is how the companies represented here and the companies in our economy have become frontline participants in warfare between uh, major superpowers as well as, as the uh, at the front line of the uh, smaller countries trying to use cyber as a way to blunt the capabilities of the United States and the West. Um, and and we're, we're a couple different kinds of participants in this. So obviously companies can become victims, right? So there's a great example of Maersk, the shipping line, was effectively a civilian casualty of cyber warfare conducted by the Russian Federation against the Ukraine. Um, this is not something that they expected, that they, they would be a casualty of this war, um, but they had a, a significant problem of, of all of their computers going down, including on their ships, and they were only able to recover after hundreds of millions of losses because they were lucky enough that one of the systems that do this work in Africa just happened to be offline due to an internet outage, and so that they were able to recover their backups from that. So you can be a, a casualty like that. The companies can be uh, parts of the infrastructure that's actually being attacked. So when you hear people from the military space talk about cyber, they talk about it as a domain, a domain of warfare. The, the traditional domains being land, uh, sea, air, and space. And that this fifth domain of cyber being different, and that is not a physical domain, but it is a space that is owned and operated often by private companies. And so private companies are operating the systems upon which these attacks happen. Um, for example, Microsoft operates the email infrastructure that powers most of the presidential campaigns in this country. And in the run-up to 2018 midterms, um, it was not very well noticed, but they talked about how they had actively detected and stopped APT28, which is the hacking arm of the uh, GRU, the main intelligence director of the Kremlin, how they had stopped these attacks. And that is because Microsoft controlled the cyber domain that needed to be used to, to do these attacks. And then companies can actually be active participants in cyber warfare. Um, when I was at, at Facebook, we operated an intelligence team. And this team had ex-NSA, ex-CIA analysts, specialists in Russia, in China, in Iran, and in Korea, whose entire job was to understand the actions of these countries and to take action to keep our users safe. Now, obviously, for the most part, these companies are not doing any direct offensive operations against US adversaries, but we are finding ourselves as a a part of the overall defense structure of the West, while often at the same time our CEOs are trying to enter the markets uh, in, inside of these countries that are US adversaries. And so companies are finding themselves in this, this new place. And there's a couple of things driving this. Um, the first thing is a number of US adversaries have created a conditions on the ground that allow for a huge amount of offensive activity against American companies. So one of the great ironies of the post-Cold War era in cyber is that in the United States, we are socialists when it comes to hacking, and Russia and China are capitalists. And what I mean by that is the people that hack on behalf officially of the United States, the people who are able to break into other countries and to not get arrested, are, are paid for by the American taxpayer. They are either civilian employees of, of the NSA, they are uniformed employees of the NSA or Cyber Command, or they're contractors working at like the General Dynamics and the Raytheons who are being paid by taxpayers and who are under the direct command and control of the President of the United States. In places like China and Russia, they have created an economic system where people are allowed to build professional hacking teams who will both do work on behalf of their local economic interests as well as on behalf of the country. Um, so I gotta be careful here because uh, half of my executive uh, co-workers at Yahoo are in the audience. I can already see them getting PTSD um, from hearing my voice again. Um, but when I was at Yahoo, we had a breach by, the, uh, by people working for the Russian government, for the FSB. So the FSB is one of the three major intelligence agencies of, of Ru the Russian Federation. The FSB and SVR are descendants of the KGB, and then GRU, who I already talked about, which is military intelligence. FSB 
these people who broke in were not uniformed members of the military. They were not civilian employees of the FSB. It was actually a, a team of hackers working for a man named Alexei Balon. Alexei's not Russian. He's actually Latvian. And Alexei, years ago, was caught by the FSB breaking into Russian companies. And uh, the story goes, that I've heard from federal agents, is that he was given a choice by the FSB. You can live out the rest of your life in this dungeon, or you can work for us. And he chose door B, right? Which turns out to be the better better lifestyle choice. And so now, Alexei is allowed and encouraged to operate a team of hackers who can go hack on behalf of Russian companies, who can go do things to steal money for themselves, but then every once in a while, he probably gets a call from his uncle at the FSB, and they ask for information that is interesting. And, and we saw this at Yahoo when we did our analysis of what they were trying to do. They were both trying to break into steal information of strategic interest to the Russian oil and gas industry, but they were also looking for information they could monetize, including possibly nude photos from celebrities, um, information they could use to spread spam, um, that they could use to, to sell uh, pill knockoffs and stuff like that. And so they are operating in the same breach. They were doing work on both sides. We actually know a lot about Alexei now because one of his employees traveled to Canada, Canada being a country with an actual legal system. Um, and while I like to imagine the Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, went up in their red suits and knocked politely to ask him to come out. Apparently, they sent a SWAT team and blew his door in. Um, and that man has now uh, been brought to the United States for justice and has pled out and has, has told U.S. law enforcement a lot about Alexei's team. But, you know, Alexei is allowed to operate there. We'd never do that in the United States. The, the other thing uh, driving this is that a number of U.S. adversaries have figured out that the number of companies that are of interest to them from a strategic standpoint is actually much larger than we'd expect. So if you think to yourself, what co companies should be worried about countries breaking into? So obviously defense industrial base, right? The Lockheeds and the Raytheons and the people who have classified information that is useful to our adversaries. You have the the oil and gas industry, the banking industry. But what you've seen more recently is the, this line descend down the Fortune 500 and well into the Russell 2000 of what is considered a legitimate target for intelligence purposes. Um, Nicole brought up Marriott. Why would Marriott International, a hotel chain, be breached by professional hackers working for the Ministry of State Security of the People's Republic of China? Why, why is that? Anybody know? What does Marriott have? Passwords, yeah, but yeah, you can get passwords. I can sell you some passwords. You want some passwords, ask me later. <laughs> Names, locations, and dates. So one of the things the PRC has figured out is that the large amounts of data held by a number of US institutions, when merged together, can be incredibly powerful. So the Chinese broke into the Office of Personnel Management, and they stole the records of everybody who has ever had a security clearance. Did you get that letter? I got that letter, a nice little thing called the SF-86. So the Chinese now know every time I smoked pot in college, it's like well documented in this SF-86. Um, so thank you, I, I, nice for the Chinese to know that. I'm sure Rachel doesn't have that section on her SF-86, but you've got different sections. Um, so the, the Chinese broke in and they stole the information of everybody who's had a security clearance in effectively the last 20 years in the United States. They broke into Sabre, which is a company that runs the back-end systems for most of the airlines in the world, right? So from OPM, they've got the list of people with class of, classified information. From Sabre, they now have every international train, uh, plane flight taken in the world. They broke into Anthem. Who is one of the largest customers of the Anthem health insurance? The United States government, including the CIA. So they have the medical records of all the CIA officers who, who work there and their family members. Um, and then they broke into Marriott, and they have broken into a couple of other smaller places. And so you take all that data, they possibly are behind Equifax. The data on that's not very well known. So you take all of that and merge it, and you can find this is somebody who is part of the CIA clandestine service. And we are able to figure out their travel plans, and we figured out what hotels they stayed at, and what um, identities they're using, and this is them landing in Beijing, and here is us using all of our video CCTV cameras in Beijing to track all of their movements, and here they are meeting with a professor of Peking University who is pro-Western, and now that person disappears into a secret prison, right? So that is why the countries that are, the companies that are targeted have, have in incredibly increased, and the unfortunate truth is if you look at even the Fortune 500, I would guess 
100 to 150 of those companies are even in the game when it comes to security, right? And by in the game, I mean you have like a reasonably competent chief security officer, you have support from the executives, you have technical security engineering staff, you do red teaming, you do simulations. 100 to 120 of the Fortune 500. The rest are totally toast if they go up against an adversary like this. And people who are doing well, again, big oil and gas, the big banks, some big healthcare, healthcare is actually very uneven, um, the big tech companies, um, and I feel really bad for my colleagues at these other companies. I was able to hire 127 people on my team. We had, again, ex-NSA Russia analysts. We had malware reverse engineers. We had experts in Windows kernel vulnerabilities. We were able to build a team like that, and that's the kind of team you need to be able to play at this level. But Marriott is not gonna be able to build that team. Right? They're not gonna build a several hundred person security engineering team with these kinds of skills. And that is where, when I think of the risk to the United States, that is my focus. We only talk about the high end. We talk about the JPMC versus the Iranians. We talk about Facebook versus Russia. But we really need to talk about all of those other companies versus all of those adversaries and how do we build an environment in the United States that supports them and that gives them the ability to start to get in the game. Because right now we are, we are not even playing. Um, so that, those are some thoughts I wanted to throw out. Uh, I'd like to invite my friend Rachel up uh, to talk from her perspective. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that, Alex. And, and Nicole, thank you for facilitating this panel this morning. A little bit from my perspective. Um, so as Nicole said, I'm Rachel Wilson. I uh, am the head of cybersecurity for Morgan Stanley Wealth Management. I've been in that job for a couple of years now after 15 years at the National Security Agency. I had a few different jobs at the NSA. I spent a couple of years running NSA's counterterrorism mission. So this is using technical means to track down terrorists and understand their communications all over the world. I spent a a couple of years in the UK helping the British get ready for the 2012 Olympics. As you'd expect, we had a large number of terrorist threats to those Olympics, but I and my team were really there to deal with the cybersecurity plots against those Olympics. So this was everything from the Chinese trying to hack into the clocks, the timers at the Olympic venues, the Russians trying to hack into the databases that house the Olympic drug testing records. Yeah, makes sense now. Didn't understand it at the time. Um, to just general miscreants really looking to rub some grit in the eyes of the British leading up to those Olympics. I watched them go off without a hitch, and I returned home to suburban Maryland where NSA is headquartered. Spent my last five years there, frankly, in my dream job, the job that I had wanted from the day I started at the NSA, and that was running that cyber exploitation operations mission that Alex described. So America's nation state hackers taking it on the offensive to our adversaries, stealing the secrets out of their networks, giving them to our policymakers, our warfighters, leading a team um, of truly exceptional technologists, military, civilian, uh, all in that well-controlled environment um, going after our adversaries' information. Um, but I had made a decision, uh, as I told Nicole, a couple of years into that job, that when it came time for me to leave the NSA, I wanted to come defend the financial sector. And that really came down to some of the things that I observed in the 2012-2014 timeframe, things folks in this room will remember, um, along the lines of uh, f f threats against the financial sector. So in that time period, we had the Iranians conducting ongoing distributed denial of service attacks against Wall Street, literally going, bank to bank to bank, conducting these attacks, debilitating to Wall Street banks across the board. And you can imagine, for those of us in government, we knew that these attacks were stimulated, were prompted by the economic sanctions that we in the international community had levied against the Central Bank of Iran, against the Iranian oil industry. We understood the asymmetric advantage that the Iranians could bring to bear. 40 guys in a basement in Tehran literally wreaking havoc on Wall Street in response to those economic sanctions. Very frustrating for those of us in government. Really nothing we could do. Hamstrung, stymied the partnership, the collaboration between government and the financial sector in that time period was not nearly sufficient and was not nearly what it is today. So maybe against that backdrop, not a surprise that so many of us from government in that time period have come to the financial sector to defend this piece of America's critical national infrastructure from those who would do us harm. So in this job today at Morgan Stanley, uh, Iran's still very high on my list. 
when we re-levied those economic sanctions last fall, what we saw is what we expected to see, which was a dramatic upswing in Iranian cyber attacks against US and UK banks. Um, we are all braced now in the financial sector to really see how much the Iranians have enhanced their cyber capabilities over the last five years since we last saw packets in anger. That remains an open question. North Korea, though, also very high on my list. So you think about North Korean economic policy, what is the strategy? Well, when you have staunch economic sanctions levied against you and you have no domestic economy to speak of, what do you do? Well, if you're North Korea, you decide that you're going to fund your government by hacking into banks and stealing money. That is truly the strategy. And that strategy is resourced at a very high level. So estimates now have it at 7,000 people in the North Korean government who have bank hacking as their full-time job. That's what I'm up against day in, day out in this role. And Alex is exactly right that the front lines for cyber war really have moved to American economic interests. So in this case, these 7,000 hackers in North Korea coming after America's financial sector against banks globally 365 days a year. But what's fascinating to see is that these threats are not limited to nation states. Alex and Nicole are exactly right. When we talk about the democratization of cyber capabilities over the last five years, enhanced, advanced cyber capabilities that five years ago were entirely the domain of nation states, now largely available on the dark web with extensive training in the form of YouTube videos. I'll tell you, as banks, uh, a group that we're really worried about right now is a group called Money Takers. You gotta love it, right? That's their name. That's their brand. Totally unabashed about what they do. They are a traditional organized crime ring, a, a criminal syndicate that is now dedicated to using cyber means to conduct their crime. And we see this at scale. Their tradecraft, just as Alex would expect, looks a lot like what we see from nation state cyber actors. Why? Because these are nation state cyber actors nights and weekends. They are moonlighting. This is their side job. Their side gig uh, is, in, in fact, participating in these cyber criminal syndicates and working uh, to attack banks that, that don't have maybe the defenses that a Morgan Stanley is going to have. Alex is exactly right that what keeps me up at night is all of these 8,000 local regional banks, credit unions across the United States, who are not spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year on cyber defenses, who don't have 500 full-time people doing nothing but cybersecurity and fraud prevention for our customers and for our clients. I see it as a key piece of my role to help promulgate these cybersecurity best practices to those 8,000 local and regional banks so that groups like money takers are not as successful as we see them today. They've successfully hit 20 different local and regional banks in the United States just in the last 18 months, and they've successfully stolen money in every case. The last example I'll give you this morning before we open up the panel, because it's worth all of us being aware of these threats as individuals, Nicole is absolutely right that the barrier to entry for cyber activities is lower than it's ever been before. For the last two years, the American banks have been working against a particular threat of, uh, it's a strain of malware out there called Marcher that targets all of you and your mobile banking apps on your phone. Um, the way it works is it essentially socially engineers you into downloading this piece of malware on your phone by pretending to be something else. None of us would knowingly download malware, so it pretends to be something else, maybe a software update, maybe a game. Marcher pretends to be solitaire. So you think you're downloading solitaire as an individual. You now have malware on your phone. The next thing it does is socially engineer you into giving it admin level privileges on your phone. So a deep level of access. You launch your mobile banking app. Marcher detects that you've launched your mobile banking app. It throws up an overlay on top of your app that looks exactly like what you're expecting to see. Same colors, same branding, completely identical but of course commanded and controlled by your hacker fraudster on the back end. You don't know this, you enter your username and password, now your username and password are compromised. What happens next? Hacker attempts to log into your account using your username and password on his device. Your bank is smart, they recognize this is not you, not Rachel's IP address, not Rachel's registered device, Rachel's not usually in Nigeria, and we prompt you with additional authentication. You know, We typically send you one of those one-time passcodes text messages to your phone, what's the problem? 
Malware's on your phone, you gave it admin level privileges, it has access to your text message queue, pulls out that message, meets your bank step up authentication challenge, off to the races committing fraud in your account. Talk about cheap, you could any of you, but don't, right, buy this particular strain of malware on the dark web today for $60. So you have banks spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year trying to protect our clients from these kinds of attacks, individual attacks against you, when the threat we're going up against, um, this, is, this is pennies on the dollar in terms of what we're going for. So, all right, Nicole, let's take this away. All right. <laughs> I had a funny, um, funny vignette to share with you on the floor at RSA yesterday, which I saw a, a security team that I recognized made up of former NSA offensive cyber exploitation specialists. And I, so I recognized a couple of them and they were going around and they were in a group in front of every, walking to various security vendors and taking selfies in front of them. And I realized they were taking selfies in front of every security vendor that they had breached. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what is it like going from being at the NSA and no knowing full well how vulnerable even the security software is and, and how big of an entryway security software can be for nation state actors, and then going to the private sector and, and creating a team or setting up an infrastructure that you could possibly defend against the people that you used to work with? So it's been really interesting, Nicole. I mean, I think when I got there, there's always this drive of let's buy more products, let's buy more stuff. And so one of the things that my team does is do a lot of these evaluations of security products that we would consider bringing onto our networks. And what we found, not a surprise, whole lot of PowerPoint out there, a whole lot of snake oil, and a whole lot of stuff that's actually worse than nothing. And so in those cases, we've tried to be really deliberate about only bringing things onto our network that we have a lot of confidence in and recognizing that any one of these technologies, anything we might buy, it's only going to be as good as we configure it to be. And so we really think that it's the human capital that's the magic behind this. It's having those experts, like Alex described, can be 10 times as important as you know, all of the vendors that we bring into our tech stack. Yeah, and Alex, I'll throw the same question at you. You, you mentioned in your remarks that it t you had a team of more than 100 people at Facebook yeah. uh, prepared to go after these threats. But what do you say to CISOs at companies that are below the Fortune 100 or in the mid-market? How do they defend against nation-state threats? So the, there's been actually a couple of positive moves that give companies opportunities. They just never take them to, to vast, vastly change their attack surface. Um, the biggest recommendation I have for CIO, CSOs of companies of any level is to put as much stuff in the cloud as possible. And this, unfortunately, 15 years ago or so, when cloud computing started to get big, 10, 15, you had security people saying, oh my god, don't put your data in the cloud. It's not under your control. But the truth is, is nobody in the world is qualified to run a secure email server against APG 2829, APG17, Ministry of State Security, except Microsoft and Google, right? And it's because they write the software. This is one of the big things I first did when we got to Facebook is we got rid of running our own exchange servers because with even the hundreds of people we had, we did not write that software. We could not fix it. We could not patch it. Um, the other thing is you never want to run a Microsoft product that Microsoft doesn't use themselves anymore, right? And they themselves have moved over to Office 365. And so I expect most of the companies here, you're running your own mail servers. I'm sorry, you're toast, right? Like if you're, if you're going up against people of this, this caliber. So move as much stuff as possible into the cloud, onto infrastructure that has professional teams, Intel teams where they are amortizing that, you know, Rachel's totally right. It's the human capital. And so we have to find ways to to amortize the limited amount of human capital we have across as many customers as possible. Um, the other thing is the consumerization of IT. You do not, most companies probably do not need to give their employees full Windows laptops, Macintosh laptops. If you can get away with iPads and Chromebooks, you are in much better shape. And that is something that from the consumer side, there are now options of very limited computing uh, systems that are much more secure because they are limited. I don't, we don't have to go into all the technical details. But if you can get away, if you move a company onto, you know, I, I'm, I'm helping some presidential campaigns who are asking some of this stuff, and I tell them, G Suite, single sign-on, um, get those two-factor tokens, give everybody a Chromebook, and you are 90% of the way there to having a reasonably secure network. Make things easy for you, make it somebody else's problem. 
One of the um, more controversial topics in the defense space is hacking back. So when you see an adversary breach your systems, can you go back and hack into their computers to figure out what they have or potentially DDoS, do, throw a denial of service attack at their computer to prevent them from, from continuing to hack you? Um, Rachel, having seen this on the nation state side and now seeing a number of these security events, I'm sure in the hundreds or thousands every day, uh, what are your thoughts on hacking back? So it's interesting because you're right. Lots of companies are actively lobbying for hack back uh, authorities at this point. Um, I'll tell you, at Morgan Stanley, it, it's our public position. It's also my, my personal view. We are not seeking those authorities. And it's really for two reasons. First, what I experienced you know, on the federal government side was that when companies attempted to go on the offensive, um, they were largely not successful at doing much of anything other than disrupting the federal investigations that were going on and were seeking to either tear down that infrastructure holistically or address that cyber act through cyber means. And so what, what I would advise against would be companies trying to hack back for what they see individually, given the risks that they present uh, to everyone else as a result of those actions. At, at a more tactical level, though, the perfect cyber actor for me is the one that I can see and hold in abeyance over here. Keep doing exactly what you're doing that isn't working, that I know I can defend against, that I have complete visibility into. I try to hack back against that activity, and I run the risk of driving that cyber actor to a place that I can't see them, a place that I can't defend against. I'd much rather know what I know, see it, be able to monitor that activity instead of prompting something. I want to keep my cards close to my vest. Every time I attempt to hack back, if I were to do so, I tip my hand. I show something about my defenses. I show something about my detective capabilities. I want to keep those cards close to my vest. Alex, what about disinformation? How, um, having been at Facebook and, and seeing the Russian disinformation campaign in 2016 and beyond, um, is there any deterrent Facebook or any other social media platforms could put up there to deter that kind of activity at this stage? Or do you think well, it'll just keep getting worse? So I, I think the strongest deterrent against disinformation and the best disinfectant here is putting sunlight on it. And I think this is a change that the companies are slowly going through, which is one of the challenges that I got to see from the inside of Facebook is going into 2016, the standard re responsibility for a company like that was to work with the federal government on giving, generally through FBI, but knowing that goes to the intelligence agencies, the information we have and our knowledge, and then letting them handle public disclosure and private disclosure of potential victims. Um, and Facebook has learned the very hard way that allowing the government to do that for you turns out to be a huge mistake, right? Um, and so this kind of component of what used to be uh, government-controlled foreign policy is now falling to the companies to figure out uh, how, you know, at what point do you say, we believe this is this government doing this bad thing, even if you're only working off a limited set of data? Um, and uh, I don't think it's actually the, the right outcome, but it's the outcome that's happening based upon the, you know, the, the, the incentive structure that's been built by uh, both people in the government, funny enough, uh, but also mostly the media, that if you don't come out and say these things immediately, you will be accused of it being a cover-up, um, even if you're just trying to be responsible about not blurting out what you know without everything else the US government knows. Um, and so I think that's the direction they have to go, is that they have to be um, explicit about this is bad stuff happening, we have a this level of confidence that it is people related to the Russian government, um, and that should generally be the best deterrent. Now, unfortunately, we are moving to a world where it seems that people don't really mind consuming disinformation that they know is disinformation as long as it reinforces their prior beliefs. And so my assumption that saying you are being manipulated, these are Russians, um, is actually a way to stop it is probably incorrect. Um, and so uh, beyond that, then we're, we're what we really need is a national strategy here about, you know, the companies can do what they can about saying things publicly, but we need to punish these actors. And the truth is, is the fact that we have let the Russians get away with it in 2016 has broadcast to the world, it is open season. And my real fear is it's, you know, this playbook is now in the hands of 
a bunch of nation states, and also private groups and private actors, it is a much cheaper and easier thing to do some of the disinformation stuff than it is to do high-end cyber you know, intrusions. Um, and so we, have, we, have, we run a risk of the 2020 election becoming the World Cup of disinformation, and that we're inviting everybody to America to try out their techniques, because there is no billionaire or country in the world that does not have some kind of desire to be reflected in the US presidential election. And we, do, we have, by not punishing the Russians, we have said, go ahead, you, know, you, you can get away with it. Um, and that's really, really unfortunate. <sighs> <laughs> All right. Um, Rachel, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is since, uh, just in the last couple of years, one of the things that uh, I've written about at the New York Times, and, and perhaps you can't talk about some of this, but <coughs> some of the NSA's own exploits have been dumped online by a mysterious group. They're called the Shadow Brokers. We don't know who they are. They possibly Russian, possibly not. Um, and those, those weapons have been picked up by North Korea and used in a massive ransomware attack called WannaCry and then uh, by Russia against Ukraine and the NotPetya attacks uh, two years ago now. And so now that those tools are out there, um, you know, how do you feel about the fact that, that's, that those are now being used on the private sector, that, that the collateral damage for some of these programs, if you can't secure them properly, um, can be seriously destructive to the US economy and, and our allies' economies? Well, I mean, of course, it's been terrible to see. I mean, that was uh, never the intent behind them, never why they were built. Um, and of course, you know, I can look back at the, you know, in some cases, near decade uh, when those same capabilities were being used to tremendous benefit uh, to the United States. And of course, we will never be able to talk about uh, that period of time and all of the incredible intelligence gains that those capabilities were responsible for. Um, and, but that's the trade-off in all of these. I mean, Alex is right. You have now uh, companies and entities all over the world that are uh, storing these kinds of exploits, storing these, these kinds of capabilities, recognizing that, that having them and using them is great and if they are disclosed then that presents huge risk. My personal view is that in the uh in the ramp up to the shadow brokers incident, um, and you know this well, Nicole, the, the government went to great lengths to immunize as much of the uh, you know, innocent bystander population as possible by working with the infrastructure owners behind those and, and ensuring that we would have the right patching solutions, that the right people would get the right information in advance. You can never do enough of that. And so it, it is not surprising that we had entities like Maersk that ended up these civilian uh, casualties as a result of these attacks, um, but I think you know the, the real downside, right, is that you know this is this is going to be continual. Um, these things always emerge over time. The shadow brokers was an incident of a, a truly you know illegal and unfortunate disclosure, um, but the release of zero days is reality, and and being ready for those and having strategies that allow us to be resilient and controls that go beyond any single point of failure that a zero day could could exploit. That's a responsibility of all of us on the security side. I see this honestly as a reflection of misplaced priorities in our government between defense and offense, right? So the United States has hyper-competent competent offensive uh, agencies in the NSA and Cyber Command. Um, we do not have a hyper-competent defensive agency, and we don't really have those voices at the table when balancing these equities, right? So DHS has a group called CISA. There are good people there, but they are nowhere near the level of competence that you see in Cyber Command and the NSA. And part of it, I think, is just what is the incentive structure inside the government? You get the secret photo shaking Obama's hand in the Oval Office. You get that from blowing up Iranian centrifuges. You don't get that because you patched 100,000 Oracle servers, right? It's all of the incentives inside the government are to blow other people's stuff up. And there's not a lot of incentive to play defense. And that's like a, a structural issue we have in that there's no one agency in charge of it, so effectively we end up with the FBI being our cyber defense agency, but the FBI, they're cops, right? Like, they're very competent and they do their job, but their natural order of things is that they watch something bad happen, they take very detailed notes, and then they indict the person responsible for it two years later, right? And other countries have people that have that proactive responsibility. In like France and Germany, we had much better partners with the French and German elections than we had in the United States. And we got way more information from France and Germany than we did from the American government in protecting their elections. So um, I think there's a, a, a real problem here that we have to structurally change inside the government. 
Do you think at Facebook, um, Facebook has a bug bounty program where they pay hackers to come to Facebook with vulnerabilities in its systems. Um, do you think that that's enough? Do you think that there's a model in the private sector that could go out there and find some of these serious exploits like a Google Project Zero? Um, the, the oh, yeah, I mean, we'll never run out of bugs. I, the truth is, I mean, systems are, the speed at which we're finding bugs is not matching up with the, the growth and complexity of systems, right? So the, the, the fact that every single one of you has a pocket sup supercomputer in your, you know, on you right now, every time you open up your iPhone and you like scroll up, you're probably doing more computations than all of the computations necessary to put a man on the moon, right? Like, I'm not kidding, like actually mathematically, you're like, man on the moon, man on the moon, man on the moon. That is like the <laughs> amount of math you're doing. That level of complexity is what leads to insecurity, and that level of complexity is going up uh, exponentially, uh, and our ability is only going up linearly, right? And so we're, we'll never match up. No, I mean, from a security perspective, finding the bugs and stopping them is not actually the solution. Like, to be a CISO these days is like, you know, certain Buddhists believe that you have to accept the inevitability of your death <laughs> to, to find enlightenment. That's what being a CISO is like. You have to accept the inevitability that you're going to be breached. And you have to think about what are the steps my adversary is going to take and how am I going to build a system to respond quickly enough and aggressively enough to stop and hold the damage. It is not I can stop breaches from happening. Breaches are only going to get more likely, but what we can do is get better about understanding that fact, finding them, stopping them quickly, and then responding with deterrence. And that's exactly it. I mean, Nicole, you know this. If we'd been having this panel like five, ten years ago, we would have been talking to you all about perimeter security. This idea that we could just build this really tall, wide wall around our networks and keep cyber actors out. That's what we've learned over the last decade, is that that is just a complete faulty uh, supposition right up front. That those concerted cyber actors are always going to find a way under, around, over that wall. And so it's even going beyond having a series of walls. It is. It's working with that inevitable, you know, that assumption that intrusion is uh, right around the corner all the time and having a strategy that is all about detecting that intrusion, quarantining it before it can spread, understanding what your crown jewels really are and, and protecting those. It, it's not an idea that you're going to, you know, have this steadfast wall around you that's impenetrable. This is why this discussion of the wall uh, is very <laughs> frustrating to those of us with any cybersecurity. Uh -oh. no, don't, don't take us that way. So with that, we'll open this up to questions. I believe there is a, raise your hand. Yeah, and we'll go ahead right here. <coughs> Hi, thanks for coming and talking to us today. Alex, you and I have a lot of similar experiences. We've worked for a lot of similar companies, probably seen a lot of similar three-letter agencies. Um, I personally have experienced um, most of the same things. Um, after I retired from a technology career, I started working for nonprofits. And nonprofits, and I would include universities uh, in that category, are targets of the MSS, for example. What do they do? They have no budget for technology to, to, to even start with. How do nonprofits, how do universities, how do other um, not-for-profit businesses start fighting this war? Yeah, they're, I mean, I was talking about for-profit companies being in trouble. Uh, nonprofits are much worse. So the, the CISO here, Michael Duffy, is a very competent guy. I would not trade places with him for all of Mark Zuckerberg's money, right? Because <laughs> being the CISO of a university, like, you can't get people to do anything here. You have no power. And so, but he has a smart, um, he, has a, he has an intelligent structure, which is what they're trying to do is to classify the things that are actually high risk. So Stanford has announced that there was a breach by the Chinese years ago looking into an, uh, you know, research here. Um, uh, and what you have to do is you have to threat model out who are our possible adversaries, what could they want, and then do the best thing you can to protect those specific assets to protect Protecting Facebook, while we didn't just say there's a hard wall, the entire production network, the entire corporate network, my expectation was we have to find and detect people and get them off. Here, you have to just accept that the Chinese government is going to have a bunch of control, a bunch of things. The, the other issue universities have is there's a significant number of, obviously, foreign students. This is a problem for tech companies, too. Um, in a lot of these cases, as you get better in cyber and cyber, you can get to a level of parity with American adversaries from a technical perspective, but your human intelligence capability is always going to be like this. Um, and I think 
that was a problem at Facebook because we had gone to a reasonable technical parity on cybersecurity, um, but still had you know thousands of people uh, who are citizens of other countries and and who I don't are not people who are coming here to be spies, but whose entire families are within the physical control of authoritarian states and therefore have no choice if they're asked to do something. That certainly is a, a significant problem at a university. Um, and so all, you've got, all you can do is, is look for the things you really, really care about. Um, and like I said, it's the same things. Move things to the cloud, give people limited computing devices, don't trust anything, be careful about um, authentication and being uh, uh, least principal, so only giving people access to things they absolutely need. Um, but in the long run, like universities are going to be porous places. It is a very difficult place to have any kind of uh, security. So the other thing I would add to that would be, you know, because of course I see it from the perspective of our clients that are university endowments and our nonprofits and the money they're trying to manage. Um, we saw a tremendous upswing in threats that were not from nation states last year, but were actually from more of these cyber criminal syndicate groups where they're going after the nonprofit to steal the donor records. They then use the donor records to call all of your donors and pretend to be you. I'm calling from you know, Stanford University Endowment. Wouldn't you like to contribute money just like you did last year? They're expecting to hear from you. It's a compelling story, and they're handing over credit card information. They're setting up fraudulent websites pretending to be yours, then using those to accept donations. So it certainly is a problem, even for houses of worship last year, huge upswing around this kind of targeting. Yeah, for the rich people here, you gotta be really careful. Like, I worked a incident response, of which there's a couple. Who here's a, a hundred millionaire? Let's hear the, see, I'm not, but yeah. The failing New York Times, right? So, like, if, you're, if you've got more than like $50 million in assets, people will spend months coming after just you. I actually worked an incident um, where a, a financial institution had a security breach, it allowed the bad guys to send emails as them, and so a criminal syndicate set up an entire fake hedge fund, including renting office space and all that kind of stuff to trick one super rich person into cutting a, a $50 million investment check and then disappearing. Um, and uh, that's worth it, right? Like for 50 million bucks, you know, I'll spend six months uh, setting up so that kind of scam, so. I see a hand over here, right at the second table. The other thing that people get ripped off all the time is Bitcoin. It's like the Bitcoin cryptocurrencies has completely revolutionized stealing money from rich people. It's kind of amazing. <laughs> First, I want to thank all three of you. It was a uh, spectacular session. Um, so between the first two, we may need an optimist to come up for the third one. <laughs> but my quick question is, is uh, we now use the uh, euphemism of kinetic war. Um, or what we just used to call war. But there's this thought out there that there should be a Geneva Convention for, for cyber so that we, uh, we reduce the collateral damage of what nation states are doing. Just wanted to get your thoughts on that. I guess I would be a skeptic. That's our theme this morning. So um, we, we, you're right, we need to find an optimist in this room. Uh, but I would be skeptical about the, about the benefits of that. You know, we talked about the analogy to a nuclear war. It was always pretty clear that if there was going to be a nuclear exchange, you would know who was nuking whom, right? In the cyber world, attribution is, it can be really, really hard. And so everyone can deny everything and potentially get away with it because it can be very difficult to know who's launching what. Uh, so I would be skeptical that that would be effective. Uh, the other piece of it is, you know, I, I think you could argue you know, that, that when the Russians conducted their campaign against Ukraine, they had no intent um, of damaging Maersk as part of that. You know, wanna cry, I don't think you could say the North Koreans were looking, down to, take, looking to take down hospitals associated with the NHS. Unanticipated consequences are, are the name of the game when it comes to cyber activities. You know, I certainly saw them from my time at NSA. You know, we did things that you know, had all the best of intentions um, and ended up with unintended consequences. Uh, and so to try to, uh, to neutralize those with some kind of treaty or otherwise, I think would be really difficult. I, I think though those countries were uh, completely irresponsible. Rachel can't talk about Stuxnet because it hasn't been declassified yet. Um, but you know nothing about it. Um, but uh, like those of us on the outside looking at Stuxnet, it was clear that it was an American piece of malware because it was the first piece of malware I ever saw decompiled that was obviously designed by lawyers, right? Um, and um, but like they they were very very careful. Stuxnet had these incredibly powerful exploit capabilities, it, and it was incredibly carefully designed to make sure not to take somebody's dam out or power grid out while it was blowing up Iranian centrifuges. Um, and so hopefully we could do that. If you if you're interested, in this, this is not my area so much. Um, I'm going to pitch a book by Amy Ziegert and Herb Lynn, who are my colleagues here at Stanford, called Bites, Bombs, and Spies. And they are experts in kind of um, 
the Cold War uh, escalation ladders and how do we establish some kind of escalation ladder that starts to push down cyber. But we've, we've gotten in terms of a weird place where countries do stuff online to each other that you know, in a kinetic situation would have been considered active wars. And we just call that like a Tuesday now, right? Um, and so we, like undoing that creation of this space is gonna be really hard. I, and I just remember after Stuxnet, the country that was advocating most for a Geneva-like convention for cyber was Russia, um, which yeah. I don't know what their motivation there was, but you know, then you hear Putin talk about how hackers are like artists and he can't control what they do. And well, but he's put together an unbreakable <laughs> cyber alliance with Trump, right? So we're good. Right. <laughs> There's some, I gotta be careful. I like to speak in front of the Hoover Institution, so I always love to talk about the people who pay my salary are also all big Trump donors. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Elevating back up to for profits, uh, boards of directors have oversight responsibility for this very issue, and hundreds and hundreds of corporations all across the country. What advice do you have for those boards of directors besides conversion to Buddhism? Um, <laughs> yeah, namaste. Uh, I guess that's not Buddhism, but um, I. So I think this is actually a place where we could have significant changes to incentivize good board structure. One of the problems we have right now is boards put cybersecurity under the audit committee. The audit committee is often chosen of people who are CFOs and MBAs. So like our audit committee at Yahoo, while really smart people included Charles Schwab, the man, um, like he's an actual guy, it turns out. Um, he's about, what, about 127, right? Um, he's an incredibly brilliant guy, but he's not going to be able to oversee this kind of responsibility. Something I like that the banks did, I don't know if Morgan Stanley's done this, is they have risk, technical risk committees that are separate from the audit committees that they put people on there who are technologists and perhaps even have security. There's a discussion of an SEC rule to require people to, to say these, these directors have cyber um, experience. Um, but the, the truth is, is, I hear this from board members all the time of like, well, we want we want to have more cyber experience, but then they don't actually recruit CISOs and ex-CISOs to be on their boards. So there's a little bit of a hypocrisy right here and that these people say that and then they go recruit other ex-CMO, CFO, CEOs just like themselves. And so boards are gonna to have to get comfortable inviting into the boardroom people who are a little different than them um, and who don't, don't fit the same mold if they're gonna to wanna to solve this issue. No, totally agree. And in fact, that's exactly the advice we give is you have to have a few people on your board who view this as their remit, who view this as their responsibility and are willing to actually dig deep. So whether you bring in a technologist to serve on the board or whether you charter that board member to say, guess what, you're going to get way outside your comfort zone and you're going to learn all this stuff and, and, and ask the hard questions, bring in your, you know, your, your uh, technology folks and ask them those things. Um, you know, otherwise, yes, it's the wrong people looking at the question. One thing you can ask explicitly as a board member is that you want to be part of a breach simulation exercise to see how people, so bring in an outside company to build an exer a tabletop exercise so that you can watch your executives figure out what to do in a breach and then experience yourself as a board, have, have them brief you as if a breach really happened so that you can get the experience of what it's like to make decisions in that, in that category. Um, the other problem that we have in the boards is boards, who do boards go to for advice when a breach happens? Lawyers, yeah. The lawyers always win. The answer is lawyers to everything, right? Um, almost no law firm has people who actually have the technical competency, and so boards should start to build those relationships. If you did one of those exercises, I think one of the things you'd think is, okay, we also need board level advisors who know how to speak the language so they can translate, and it's not, because one of the things that I've seen personally, a number of companies that I've been involved with have over-legalized the response to breaches, and that over-legalization can cause lots of trouble in the long run. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, okay, we'll try for uh, two. <laughs> is it okay? Um, so, I, mine's kind of, this is a very interesting panel, by the way, and so my, my question is how much uh, sort of the legislature has been responsive to what the actual threats are. It always seems to me that there could be really <laughs> drastically changed laws having to do with the punishments for participating in any kind of cyber crime, especially things like phishing or you know, identity theft or whatever, and really make it demonstrable and clear as to what the consequences are and make them extreme. And then the second thing is that it just seems to me that the internet is obviously you know, the infrastructure that we all depend on, and it hasn't changed that much. In other words, the the requirements, for, for example, to be actually a routable entity on the net are the same as when it first got started in terms of the TCP IP protocols. And it just looks like these company, countries like China or whatever who have 
you know, their own routers with lots of um, embedded keys and observation, their ability basically to stamp down on anything that actually they don't approve of, that's a huge advantage relative to controlling their local infrastructure. And ours, there's no, there's no over, overarching policy. It's red light's flashing, sir. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Our red light's flashing. But do, do you guys have a quick answer? So I would just say quickly to that, you know, part of the challenge in terms of legislating our way out of this is that, you know, so many of these cyber actors are jurisdictionally well out of our domain. Um, you know, and, and as people who've tried to set, call the Russians and say, could you please stop doing this? Nobody's answering that, call, that phone call. Um, the other challenge we have, though, is, you know, and, and where I think maybe legislation could help us uh, is in the, you know, the consequences for being the hacked entity. I mean, you look at Equifax, largest breach of American personally identifiable information in history. We're going to be dealing with the artifacts of Equifax for decades. And what was the consequence there? I mean, Congress is still talking about it, but it's hard to see maybe additional regulation, but, but there hasn't been much consequence in those cases. Well, the problem with the consequences is they're dealt out by class action shareholder attorneys, which is absolutely the worst way to get people to do the right thing, is to have like class action bottom feeding attorneys try to make it happen, because they're just trying to get the money. They don't try to fix anything. I actually think, I, want, I would go the other way. If I was going to have the legislation for anything, you need to create safe harbors for people to report their breaches, and then to address the core issues. Because one of the problems is we only hear about the 10% of breaches that involve personal data. Probably 80-90% are about intellectual property or about money or about long-term strategic interest. We don't hear about those things and companies will never announce them because the moment they do, there's 500 lawsuits that are automatically filed for class action status, right? And so we need to create, the aviation industry has this thing where you can report, I was in a near mishap, right? And, and you you don't get punished for reporting that something bad happened. There's, there's a focus on fixing it. And we gotta stop focusing on punishing victims. We gotta focus on supporting and helping victims get through it. Um, and with that. <laughs>